All right, and here we are live. This is the Greybeard, and uh, I'm joined today, as you can see, by the data chef on Tertio. So, hey, say, <laughs> the, the, well, I'll give Tom a chance to introduce himself, but I want to tell everybody thanks for coming on again. I want to apologize for the glare in my glasses. I've got the my laptop in a funny direction this time, and it. Well, I always have glare in my glasses, but this is unusually bad. So, <laughs> got to get you a pair of uh, glare-free glasses, there, Bruce. Uh, you know, my wife keeps telling me that, but I'm stubborn. I, I guess I need to need to figure out how to get that done. So here we are. Um, this is good. I've been looking forward to this for a long time because I, I remember the first time I met Tom, I was a little um, intimidated, I, I guess you'd say, because I, his reputation preceded him. And he was a former critter from Critigen. And, uh, you know, I just, it was just one of those things where I thought it would be an intimidating thing. But as soon as I met Tom, it wasn't, I probably five or 10 seconds, I immediately knew how much I liked him. So, hey, Tom, why don't you take a minute and uh, just introduce yourself, tell us where you come from and all that stuff. Oh, sure. Why not? So let's see. I've been in this industry for about 35 years. Uh, my background's distributed architecture design and analysis, in particular performance, reliability, high availability. Um, had my own startup where we built a framework that actually could monitor all that. Um, had a number of blue chip clients. And then I found myself at uh, Business Objects in the 2003 time period. Uh, and I was director of performance and scalability, which made sense given what I just told you. And that job was in Paris, France. So yeah. in 2004 through 2006, my wife and I lived in the 17th arrondissement in, in Paris. I ended up back stateside business objects, which turned into SAP. Uh, and then uh, at SAP, I reprised as a performance and scalability uh, expert, or actually in charge of actually that globally. Uh, and then a, a phone rang. Hold, hold, hold on, I'm gonna, inter I'm gonna interrupt and say, I wanted to go down this road and, and Tom's taken <laughs> right down the road I wanted to go down. And I wanted to, to talk about the Critigen Tertio family tree. And there, yeah. there, there's a place at which Tom's family tree intersects with the Critigen. I, I was just about to go there. I got, I got you, go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and the phone rang and it was this uh, geospatial company, uh, ArcGIS, Esri Platinum partner, been doing geospatial a long time. And uh, I was asked if I would consider becoming the uh, chief technology officer uh, <laughs> around that time. Geospatial actually was coming up more and more in conversations internally at SAP and certainly in my own personal interest. And I figured what better way to learn geospatial. And I was up front. I said, I don't really know geospatial. And the comment was, well, we don't we don't care. It's, it's you we want. You, you'll figure out the rest of it. All and right. so in April of 2011, I became CTO at Critigen and um, pretty much learned in about six months um, that spatial is the way you want to operationalize your data. You want to operationalize your enterprise. It's the way you want to consume insight. Um, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a map is worth a thousand data tables. So you want to get the point across in about a half a second, put your data on a map, on a good map that's cartographically correct. Um, and I learned about how that's not trivial. Uh, you know, my first six months at, at Critigen. So, so that, 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 you know what, I didn't know the BI part of it, the, the business objects thing. I didn't know that you were involved in business uh, um, business intelligence before you came to Critigen and then you put the bio, the geospatial piece to it. Yep. And then after that, the, where'd you go after that? What'd you do? Well, what happened was I learned that geospatial computations, while they're computationally intensive, they can be data intensive. I have IoT, I have AVL, I have AMI, I have all this data coming in from all over the place. I want to represent it and roll it up in a way that means something to the business user. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that takes computational power. It also t involves taking data from a number of different data sources. One of the uh, customers that we had at Critigen was a, a US government agency, it doesn't matter which one. And through them, I met the folks at SAP's National Security Services, or NS2. And we began to do work with each other because they were doing you know, really heavy data lifting with HANA and spatial. And Critigen, a number of its areas of expertise, including the more difficult the problem, the better Critigen is, right? Throw something at us that was really gnarly, we'd figure it out. Right. And nobody else could do that. That was always impressed me of the folks that I work with at Critigen. Um, but 
we were really good at building some slick uh, ArcGIS based native iPad apps. And that's exactly what NS2 was looking for. So we started playing around with large data sets, as you can imagine what NS2 does for a living. Right. And um, you know, we were doing 300 million uh, point k-means clusters before the stuff was even turned on in HANA. You know, we're working with them. It's like, you're going to turn the switch on? I don't know. Will it stay up? I don't know. And of course, it wasn't production yet. So the first time we did it, it didn't stay up. But point is, once we got the, uh, the code fixes, um, three seconds to do 300 million point uh, k-means cluster. And that just blew me away as a performance person. And that comes from a number of things about HANA. Well, hang on just a minute. I, you know, I, I, get, I let this thing slip away from me so quickly, unfortunately. But so I'm going to ask you a question, but I, I don't want you to answer it until the end. Because I know that you, you're one of those bright people that you got things going on in all parts of your brain. So this is something that, that I meant to ask you up front, but instead we're going to talk about it at the end. And that is, like, I, I've been making a practice of asking everybody I know, because um, I'm kind of fond of the saying that life doesn't happen to us, it happens for us. And so, especially in terms of your professional life and, and your maybe even your technical expertise, I want you to, to talk at the end, just tell me a little bit about what the pandemic has done for you rather than to you. Okay, just-, well, that's just Boy, there's a lot there, but okay, I'll park yeah, that. That's at the end, and, and I, I know you can keep that together, but I just didn't want to let that go because I knew that I would let it go. You were getting ready to start, you were, you were gonna start talking about the special powers of HANA. And that's one of the things that I, I kind of promised everyone that we would dig into is, you know, sure. things, things like, you know, what are the basics of how an in-memory database works? You know, just because I, I think some people some people know that well, but others maybe don't know the, even the basics there. Yeah, so HANA is the underpinning of what SAP, we call the, the uh, business technology platform that includes a, a number of different pieces. HANA's core of it. Uh, HANA does a number of things. We talk about the database, which I will in a second. But one of the things that impressed us about HANA when I was at Critigen was the ability to pull in data from anywhere and either materialize it virtually or physically in HANA, uh, depending upon what your needs were. But the fact was HANA was designed to not have to move data. And this actually plays into the performance things that people say HANA has magical power as well. When you're architected from the ground up as an in-memory platform, uh, there's a number of things that you don't have to deal with. Disk-based database systems and DBAs play games to trade-offs between um, you know, RAM, memory, and disk, right? So mm -hmm. you want more performance, you create more indices, um, you, you're optimized for certain queries, not optimized for others, and you spend your day doing nothing but that kind of stuff. Um, the DBMS has to figure that out. It weighs pages and different kinds of pages, pages things in and out. Well, um, you know, certainly on the HANA side, we have the capability of warm and cold storage, but I'll just talk about the in-memory or hot storage here. Not, okay, not right. so we're talking, about, we're talking about in-memory storage, right? Yep, so now, now I'm going to the, the core pieces, what was first released with HANA. Oh, wait, so hold hold that thought. Hey, I didn't ask everybody to uh, to <laughs> put in the comments where you're, where you're watching from. It, it helps Tom and I to know exactly kind of who we're talking to. So take a minute. Uh, Go down to the comments and just type in where you're from. It'll tell me your name. Just type in where you're where you're uh, watching. And then, okay, so we're going to go down to the. We're looking for a little more information than in your home office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I've had a few of those. One, like one guy said, in my basement. I'm I'm kind of looking at, in your basement in what municipality? Okay. So anyway, so go ahead. Well, anyway, so 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 the you know the the in memory components what came out first then. You know, data tiering came out. And now we have network um, um, storage extensions or native storage extensions. Sorry, um, and NSC is like I said, warm and cold, and it's all transparent to the user. It's specifiable or it's automatic. You get to pick it. But let's talk about the in-memory piece. So when you're designing a columnar in-memory database, one is scans are incredibly fast. Um, compression is very high. Um, we work with specific instructions in the Intel chipset. To take to make HANA fast, um, just look up SIMD, S I M D, um, and you'll find a white paper on it. I, I we don't have time to go into what that is, but the point is HANA scans incredibly fast. Does a number of things for you. The first thing it does is it well your footprint's reduced because of the compression. 
Um, but it also means if I can scan very fast, I don't need to pre-aggregate. You never lose detail in HANA. Uh, there's a customer of ours in Europe, and every customer who checks out of their stores, a row gets written into a table. As of last October, it was 9 billion rows and growing. They run all of their analytics off that table. You never lose detail. So from a DBA standpoint, you're not spending time figuring out what roll up do I need to do? What result table do I need to create? What ETL do I need to write? And the other thing that HANA does is it figures out on the fly how to execute the query you submitted to it. Now we do have the ability to create- If you want to, if you boil it down to the basic, mm -hmm. that, that, I, that, that fact that it doesn't lose detail, is that how things, is that, is that how it works so quickly? Is that how it processes? This is one of, the, one of the key things. Okay. And the other one is the, these engines that we talk about. So we have, we're talking about the spatial engine here. We have graph and we have predictive and there's text and there's all kinds of other en engines that sit there. They operate on the single copy of the data. So if you think about graph for a second, I want to do say some graph or maybe some, some predictive work. I might have to copy the data off to a system that did graph or predictive, get the results, bring the results back, bring mash it up with the data I already have. In HANA, you don't have to do that. I just run that in HANA using that engine against the single copy of the data. Anytime I don't move data, I gain performance. I okay. gain significant performance. So it isn't just about the speed of scanning. It's about the fact that you can do all of those things in memory alongside a single copy of the data. Um, th those are two things that allow it to do what it does. And in particular to ArcGIS, I'll just, you know, I, I, you tell me if you want me to wait or not, but- No, no, that, that's good. Go ahead. Yeah, one that's one of the things that, that Esri told us when they, when they got their hands wet and built the HANA prototype, is they said, you know, usually we teach best practices. Um, if you have over 10 million rows in a summary, you build a summary table. Don't scan because you'll get uneven performance across the different DB messages we support. Sure. Um, right. right? So that's one. And, yeah. and, and every ArcGIS admin lives with this stuff. Um, you know, don't do uh, non -space, don't do spatial filters. So if I say I have a polygon, what's inside of it? Some DB messes can handle it and some can't. Um, write narrow queries. So I join back to my base data to get my shape and I go to my summary table to get whatever I've aggregated up to and I display it. Well, HANA has no trouble handling wide queries and HANA doesn't need to pre-aggregate. So what they said was those three best practices they teach do not apply when the DB mess is HANA. So HANA is the only supported geo database that offers the fact you don't have to create result tables and you don't have to build secondary indices. And if I only have a polygon, right? Cause it's, cause the dirty secret, dirty little secret Bruce is I don't always have a zip code or a census block group number or something or a state code. I just have a polygon. What's inside of this? This hack keeps walking yeah, no, around. I was just going to say, Hey, feel free to ditch the hat. Cause yeah, I, I, sure. I can ditch the hat. Doesn't cover much anyway. You just didn't want to expose the fact that that I've got more hair both here and here than you. Do. That, that's right. Well, see, that's why I'm not the gray beard. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> um, but, but this is all pretty cool because you know it was actually Esri that you know came to us and said, by the way, these things don't apply if you're running on Hana. And it's like, of course we should have known that because since Hana was first released in 2011, we have tens of thousands of customers. And they're doing things like not creating result tables. They're creating virtual data warehouses. So they're not moving all their data into HANA. They're referencing it on the fly via what's called smart data access. They're mm -hmm. querying the data in place. Um, they're not building result tables, they're not building indices. Well, if that worked in 2011, and since spatial is another native data type of HANA, certainly would work against spatial you know, data. And you're not usually aggregating on the spatial data, you're aggregating on attributes on the spatial data. Okay. Of course, this would be the case. But Esri was the one who said, by the way, we think this is important because our customers don't like doing this stuff. Um, and, well, and, and I mean, you're, we, I think this is one of the benefits that I'm pretty familiar with in that, you know, we, the, the GIS organizations, they, they've got other things to do at their time other than, than do, you know, cr um, maintain data processes, right? And so that's a big, that's a big benefit well, for most. Well, maintaining ETL is, uh, 
you know, the ETL gets more complex, the more you add to it, it gets more branches to it. And that stuff has to be approved by change control. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says to you, Bruce, I want to see my data sliced this way. Uh oh, don't have a result table. Okay. Um, you got to write to ETL, wait four weeks for get approved in, in an energy company in the East Coast. It takes four weeks. And then four weeks later, you can get somebody their answer. Wouldn't it be nice if you can give them the answer the next day or maybe even on the same day? And, and that's what we call it the agility. But the one thing I wanted to make sure I didn't miss, because I know how time flies with these things, yeah, um, is the integration with transactional data. And you know, a number of companies have a lot of, um, hang on, let me just dispense with this. No, that's okay. And actually, while you're dispensing, hey, thanks everybody who's put your, your, uh, your city in that you're calling, that you're watching in. So now I want to just pr prompt you and, and say that I, I know, I know for a fact that we would like to answer some questions if you have any of them. Uh, but I appreciate everybody kind of weighing in. If you have anything, if there's, if he's saying anything too quickly and you want him to repeat, let me know because we'll we'll bring him back uh, bring him back to the surface if we need to. Well, I got to um, get a real data chef hat. See, yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, I got the you know, oops, other side. I got the SAP logo over here somewhere. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't have the meat thermometer, and the hat doesn't quite fit. But here's a real <laughs> chef's jacket. Chef Tom, I love that. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, so the the one thing I was saying was the integration with transactional data. If you look at a lot of the world's enterprises use Business Suite, SAP Business Suite, uh, or the latest variant, S4, which is optimized Business Suite for HANA. Suite on HANA is really nothing more than any DB ECC that runs on HANA. So regardless of which one you're in, you have a lot of data in there, and about 80% of that stuff has geolocation in it, which okay. means you bring it alive on a map. Uh, and if you're an asset-intensive industry, utility, uh, midstream, upstream oil, um, departments of transportation, you know, all that transactional information sitting out there in the SAP system, and you have your system of record or your geometry sitting in the ArcGIS system, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could surface that transactional information, all that master data on a web map, or maybe on a mobile device on a web map, uh, web map in an app, doesn't matter. And, and the fact is that when the geo database is in HANA, um, HANA has native capability called SDA, which I mentioned, way of virtually referencing data where it where it sleeps. Yeah, we also have something called CDS views in S4. Core data service is what that stands for. And CDS views come with S4. We ship these at no additional cost. It turns all of those short six character German column names in the schema, say, of plant maintenance into human readable column names. Okay. And it creates things in, in the semantically rich objects like notifications, equipment, work orders, functional locations. And since we maintain that, you don't have to worry about the schema changing underneath you. You reference the CDS view, it'll never change. So we support that and it's included. Um, yeah, you know, did, and so everybody listen closely. This is where when Tom and I were prepping for this, he, he brought up a term that was new to me, which is always on integration, right? Yeah. So, so this is a this is kind of a concept where with the CDS views, then you, you have the ability to have this always on integration well, near, near real time. Well, let's talk about a company that we, we, we've both done work for, um, and that's a reference for SAP, is the city of San Diego. The city okay. of San Diego has fire hydrant information that used to be six months old. In their, in their GIS system. They're pulling it out of their SAP system. And so you bring up a map and you don't know whether the hydrant was out six months ago or it's out they're today. Creating, so they're creating a data dump from SAP yep. and then they're loading it in the GIS system. So they had six month old data about that asset in their GIS. Correct. Okay, it's so how do, you, how do you change that then? So, so what happened was I, I, I was you know working with uh, Joe Brenton, um, you know, was down there with me and uh, Jay uh, Rajmahan from, from Esri and some other folks. And, and we were working together on this thing. And what we did was we used SDA, Smart Data Access. And at the time we were going against Suite on HANA. So there weren't CDS views, but CDS views actually makes the story better. And what we did was using SDA, we had the reference and the geometry to the asset in the SAP system. Um, and so we just simply did a query in a query layer in ArcGIS to go get the uh, status of the of the asset of the fire hydrant. 
And we were brainstorming, we we're sitting there going, what could we do with that data if we exposed? And we came up with about six different things we could expose in about a 10 minute period. We figured out we could show, say, work order history. How many work orders? How many emergency work orders are issued? How often was the hydrant out in the last six months, eight months, 10 months? And we could all expose that on the fly, always connected using SDA, just by virtue of putting the geo database, in this case, publication geo database, in right. HANA with a query layer from ArcGIS, I could reach out and go get that information on the fly. I never have to copy data. I don't have any latency anymore. Um, and then as for the story gets better and Critigen's in the SAP Co-Innovation Lab. And one of the things that you set up and demoed at our Utilities Innovation Day uh, in February, which was in person, the last in-person event, by the way, I was I was able to attend. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Yeah, and then we did a virtual one in, in May because, of course, COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and and basically, what you were able to show was you could go against a CDS view and get information about a newly created work order. So you could show a created work order, and then on the map, work order appears, and the metadata from the SAP system appears on the map. And all of that was done without coding. It was configuration based out of the box integration. And so when you look at all that information about your assets in, in, in business suite, and if you have S4, you use the CDS view. So you just look for the CDS view and it goes into the ABAP layer. So this is important for folks on the, on, on the phone or, watching right. or live stream, I should say, yeah. to understand is when you use CDS views, you're not undercutting ABAP security. You're going in as an ABAP level user and that's done via smart data access using what's called data provisioning agent, which is part of SDI. The whole thing is you know, SDAs in there too. And in enterprise HANA, that, that comes out of the box, it's included. And so this always on capability, and I think you're seeing it at, at Critigen too, customers wanna unlock the value of that data. Um, and, and I have a, I can't say the name of the uh, of the of the reference yet, although they've signed their release forms. I still can't say anything because we haven't publicized it externally. But there was a government. We both know who you're talking about. So. Oh, OK, well, that's OK. And yeah. I still can't say it, though. Okay. Um, I, I see some great questions coming up. OK, um, well, yeah. But let, let me finish this thread first. Yep. Um, and we went in and said, look, you, you have uh, REFX, so the real estate module S4. You have the geo enablement framework in, so you got your relationship. You have sync, so that way your assets know about your geometries and vice versa. How about we come in and basically show you what you could do by actually mashing these two data sources together? And so a couple of my colleagues in Europe um, sat down. I wasn't able to go because of COVID. Um, and, and basically, this is what they said to us. Um, by being able to reference on the fly, always on, from the GIS system of record, um, yeah. which ArcGIS, over to REFX, they were able to eliminate uh, error-prone uh, and, and redundant business processes such that the information would make it to the business 40% faster than it did before. So think about your business. Now you're gonna say there are governmental agencies, real estate. Well, real estate's an asset, it just doesn't move. Right, Let somebody lift up your house and moves it somewhere. Um, utilities have moving assets, but the same thing applies by connecting these things in an always on capability. You're unlocking and making business processes more efficient and eliminating manual ones that are error prone. Um, so there, there are two, two things there. Maybe if we have, if after you answer this question from Don, if we have a chance to go back to it, I want you to talk about how I talk about how. Um, putting the publication geo database on uh, on Hana can be a really good interim step. Like rather than yes. trying to do this, so let's 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 save that one. But Don says, how big an organization or data set would you need to take advantage of this? Um, and I think that kind of plays into that. You know, depending on what your goals are, it doesn't have to be big, right? Yeah, it it, it doesn't. So there's a couple of things because you the one question you asked me to park actually plays to I think what Don's asking is. If you have a lot of uh, result tables that you're building every night as part of your, you know, your geo database to provide your read-only users, because 
everybody knows the bulk of the users in an ArcGIS system and enterprise are read-only users, and they're going after information that you're distilling for them, the insight that you're creating. If you're constantly building these tables and they take hours to build and you're doing it every night, you have to ask yourself the question, would you rather be doing that or would you rather be doing something higher value? So if the amount of data in your organization is causing you to run into this, just simply putting the publication geodatabase on HANA and refactoring the SQL to aggregate on the fly, since you're not building um, uh, result tables, and I see cost versus size, yep, it, it, it's a fair question. So you have to weigh um, you know, the, the, the value of your resources, the time it takes, the amount of times that you have to turn, um, you know, your internal stakeholders away for information because you don't have that result table built, um, or it just takes too long to run it, or there's things you wanted to do to analyze the data but you can't because these other things basically make it impractical to even consider doing it. So, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Um, I would say this: if your if your uh, organization is on the road to S4. So if you're in an SAP shop, um, then you should definitely consider the publication geo database as an interim step, because as Sempra's finding out, and Sempra's spoken at our conferences that I mentioned, so I think I can mention their name, and Critigen, of course, is doing the work. Yep. They're moving their geo databases to HANA. Mm -hmm. and I don't think I can say where you're moving them from. That might be something you guys can say, but I won't say it. Um, and they're doing it for the reasons that I stated. Now, this is, you know, clearly a large organization with a, you know, over 20 terabytes of geospatial, of geo databases. And I'm sure, Don, you're probably saying, I, I don't have 20 terabytes. So the break even that, you know, Esri's rule of thumb is if you have over 10 million rows that you're constantly computing every night for roll up, um, you, you might want to take a look at this. And, and don't forget, we have HANA Cloud is released and is certified as a geo database by, by Esri. Um, and HANA Cloud, you only pay for what you use. You, there's no licenses to purchase, no hardware, no VMs to spin up. You go in and say, I want 40 gig, so many CPUs, and then you just pay for what, for what you want. So you can, read, you can read that for yourself. This anonymous LinkedIn user wondered about the cloud platform the SAP HANA. Yeah, so you, you have options, you know, depending upon the, the, the cost point you're at. Um, and let's see, there's other questions here I'm looking to see. Uh, let's see. Oh, so cloud platform. So we, right. in AWS, I, I don't believe it's in Goggle. <laughs> I, 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 it's not in all hyperscalers yet. I want to say it's AWS and Azure. I, I can I can check. You get back to Bruce. I can I can verify for you. Um, but but in any event, um, one of the things about Hana Cloud is because it's cloud based from the ground up. We have a number of connectors to different um, things like S3 buckets and Azure Data Lake and other things. So it makes it very easy to pull in data from other sources. And and the one thing about HANA Cloud or HANA on-prem, if I'm referencing on the fly and I say, gee, you know, this is great, but my performance isn't where I want it, you flip a switch and HANA will automatically replicate. But the choice is up to you. We don't force you to, to make a copy of the data. But if you want that option, it's there. And so from the standpoint of a single pane of glass, um, geospatially enabled single pane of glass at the cloud level, HANA Cloud um, offers a lot of capability and connectivity to other cloud sources, regardless of where they are. Okay, so that's a that's a good place to stop there with cloud. But thanks okay. to the question. How about the how about the API question? Does SAP HANA API allow for open source um, geospatial integration? Probably. Yeah. So so HANA is OGC compliant. Um, and so as long as 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 long as an an, an open source geospatial I know is OGC compliant. So as long as it's OGC compliance, you can use HANA to store natively and query and operate against spatial data. Okay. Um, and 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 actually it was Esri that encouraged us to put in the OGC compliance because as much as Esri would like everybody to use ArcGIS, they know they don't. And so HANA basically has had OGC compliance uh, spatial since it was released, 1.1 actually. 
Yeah, and, and I think that Suresh is asking, do we have to pay the public cloud provider like Azure uh, or um, or AWS? Um, so the no. answer is for HANA Cloud is, is no. So okay. you, you, you go in to SAP Cloud Platform, right? You create, you create a global account. And once you create a global account, you go in and say, I want to create a, a space for my work. And then you say, I want to create a HANA Cloud instance. And you say, I want so many gigs, so many CPU. And if you want, you can also spin up a data lake, which is Sybase IQ technology. And, and you can tell it how big the data lake is if you want. And that data lake integration with that HANA Cloud instance that actually are basically like this. Yeah. Um, that's uh, an optimized version of uh, smart data access. So you can you can work against uh, data in the, in that data lake in the Hana Cloud data lake. So, like I said, if you want the data lake, you turn it on. And you pay for it. You don't want the data lake, you don't turn it on. You don't pay for it. But but no separate license and um, and and hyperscaler fee. You know, this is a be a separate conversation. If you said, I have AWS and I want to run Hana on prem. Well, right. You're paying AWS for the VM, and then you're paying the HANA license. But HANA Cloud, no. Okay. So I, I, for, through SCP. I can see the HANA Cloud probably would deserve its own show. So at some point here in the next several months, I need to have you back, and we can uh, we can answer some of these questions about HANA Cloud. That might be a good thing. Now yeah. I, I know we're over time. Do you have Do you have two minutes? You could an answer that question I asked you before. So. On the pandemic, so no, um, it's, it's, yeah, a pandemic. Like, what good has happened? I want to hear the good stuff. Like, tell me um, what good has happened for the you. Good stuff uh, is uh, well, yeah. We we have a lot of hospital networks as clients, um, and right after the pandemic hit full force, my work my work week went from like fifty hours and change to seventy hours and change. I hear and, you. I feel you. I feel you. And why did it do that? Because our customers in, in large networks in, in, in the Midwestern US um, basically said, can you help us do demographic analysis? Can you help us do spatial analytics? We have ArcGIS, how do we get these things to work together? How do I show comorbidities on a census block group level? How can I predict the demand on my hospital emergency room so I know what kind of wave of people I'm gonna see um, with COVID and COVID related issues? So. The really cool thing about, although we were working a lot, um, we were actually doing significant good in helping these hospital networks prepare to provide the care for their customers who un unfortunately uh, got COVID. Okay, uh, it sounds like that sounds like a good a good story. I like that. I like that. So you and I can uh, talk about that next time we get. Yeah, together. before I knew what June was, June had arrived. Yeah, so well, I know it, started, it went really started fast. in early March. It was crazy. It was nuts. Um, Hey, I want to do one last thing. I'm going to ask everybody to take a look. If you've got one minute left before you go, before you log out, um, I would love it if you would, if you just take a second and put something good that's happened to you or for you, for you during the pandemic, put that in the comments because I'd love to read those good thoughts. It helps me and it's a good thing, I think, to to recognize and share what the good things are instead of uh, there's there's too much gloom and doom out there. So take a minute before you leave and just put in the comments what good things have happened to you. Tom, I knew it was going to be a challenge to, to keep you out of the weeds, but I think there was a lot of value from you diving so deeply. Um, so I really appreciate you taking your time to do this today. Yeah, I'm just honored to have been on the gray beard. I mean, I, I can check it off my bucket list, man. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, just put... Everybody, everybody, if everybody felt like that, we would have an unlimited audience and everything would be hunky dory. So let's let's try and get everybody on board, Tom. Well, I'm happy to come back. All right, we'll do it. Thanks so much and you have a great day, okay? Yeah, and thanks everybody for your time. Super. All right, bye now. All right, see ya.